We are back on Get Up, and SEC Media Days continues. Today is day three in Dallas. We will have Alabama and Texas among the teams talking today. So the heavy hitters, Bama's coach Kalen DeBoer, will also be live on this show at 9.30 Eastern time, so don't miss our conversation with him. But right now, we talk with Heather and Sir Paul, and it's always a delight to have you guys. Let's do this. Let's start with a game of fill in the blank. So, Heather. Kalen DeBoer, he's filling enormous shoes, replacing Nick Saban. His top priority is what? It's getting the most out of his quarterback, Jalen Milrow, and he was sacked 44 times last year. He'll take ownership for some of those. Michael Penix Jr. was sacked only 16 times in 28 games under two seasons under DeBoer, so he knows how to protect his quarterback, but Milrow has to know what to do, too. Paul, how would you put into words the pressure living there as you do living in this as you do and hearing from probably more SEC fans than any other person alive. How would you describe the pressure that exists on Kalen DeBoer this year to get into the playoffs? It is enormous Greeny and I know he's coming up here in a few minutes and I'd rather not have you show this to him but he better get to the playoffs. It is that simple. He didn't take this job uh, to go eight and four and get a nice Florida bowl trip. Alabama is, ex has, is used to playing in the national championship game. So if Kalen DeBoer doesn't make it to the playoffs this year, it's a bust. And I can't play that for him in 45 minutes. Can I just, <laughs> can I, can I just confirm yeah. with you? <laughs> well, I, I, guess, I guess you can. It's your, it's your show. No, no, well, it's your relationship, though. I, I, you know, you and Nick love each other. I want to make sure you and Kalen get off on a good foot. Anyway, we'll have Kalen DeBoer live at 930 Eastern. Paul, Paul, let me give you one then here to start. Uh, Texas, the newcomer, will win the Southeastern Conference this year if what happens? If Quinn Ewers, number one, can stay healthy, uh, he has not been healthy in the past. He's missed a number of games even though they do have Arch Manning as a backup. Uh, and, and I think he can be elite. He, uh, he, is, he is one of the best quarterbacks in the country over the last couple of years, going into college and even last year at various times. But, but he, he can't have off games, not with the schedule that Texas has. So if he's elite, Texas has a real shot. Well, so Heather, I guess I would put it to you this way. Georgia is the favorite. If not them, is it Texas next up in your mind? Absolutely. They've got the depth that it's going to take to contend for the national title because when you're playing a season that long, that's what you need. Sark has that on the offense and defense. They've got to get better, though, at pass defense. It's still a premium in winning the SEC. They ranked 113th in the country last year in pass defense, allowing about 250 yards per game. That Washington game, they racked up like 400 passing yards. The loss to OU, the same, over 280 yards. They've got to shore that that up to win the SEC. Okay, so we've got the new faces and the new places, and we'll get into all of that. But it is also, as Heather has done an outstanding job outlining for us over the months and now these last few days, we're in a whole new world of college football, particularly with the 12-team playoff. So are there unintended consequences of that? Clemson's head coach, Dabo Sweeney, who of course knows about high-level winning, thinks this move could lead to some unintended negative consequences like teams and players sitting their stars, all that sort of thing. Take a listen to Dabo Sweeney. You'll probably see some guys if, if you're four and four and probably out of the playoffs, probably see some guys head off to Arizona and train. You'll probably see some situations like you see in the NFL. Ravens are in the playoffs. They got it locked up, right? They got the bye. They got one more game that really means nothing. Did you play Lamar in that game? Maybe you're 11 and 0, and you got that rivalry game. But oh, you play your biggest foe next week in the conference championship, and if you win that game, you're going to get a bye. Those are things that are probably decisions you'll see play out all throughout college football. Paul, is he right? <laughs> no, he's not right. D Dabo, that is just plain dumb. Uh, I mean, w what happened to you? I mean, you used to be a voice of reason in college football, and now you're the get off. Uh, my lawn guy. I mean, th th everybody knows what we're doing here. Uh, everybody understands this is essentially the NFL playoffs. And of course, there's unintended consequences. That is not breaking news, Dabo. Your goal isn't to find problems with this system. Your goal is to get back in the playoffs, someplace you haven't been in a while. I, I guess, Heather, what I would say in response to it is it it really very similar to what Paul said. Yes, he's right because we are now going from a sport that has historically always been focused almost exclusively on its regular season 
and it is becoming a postseason driven sport like practically all the rest of them are and thus you're going to see those kinds of adjustments being made immediately does that does that make sense well, it makes sense, but I would also argue that the regular season is going to matter more than ever because it's the five highest ranked conference champions who are getting into this thing and the four highest ranked get a first round bye. But if you don't win your conference title, you have to win four straight games to win the national championship. And I asked Kirby Smart about this because if you're the second team in the SEC, what happens? It's a tough spot to be in. And he told me, I worry there's a situation where somebody goes, you know, we'd be better off not playing our starters and not winning this game so we don't have to go play in that game, but yet we can still get in the show. I hope that doesn't happen. And he told me, he was very clear, that the SEC championship to him is just as valuable as the national title because they're both so difficult to get to. But if you're playing in that conference championship game, I don't care if it's the Big Ten, SEC, ACC, Big 12, and you lose, that is a tough road to win the national title for a very good team. Well, this is why we need Heather, because that's an excellent explanation. There are such enormous benefits. Yes, these teams may still get in and be part of the 12-team field, but there is so much benefit in being at the very top of it. Those will continue to be reasons why the Kirby Smarts and the Dabo Sweeney's and the Steve Sarkeesian's and all the other coaches will continue to play their guys. This is just my new favorite comedy team. Here was a little insight into the hardest coaching job Nick Saban ever had. Do you remember me trying to teach you how to play bump and run? I do, and... I'm, that, I, mean, I just want you to know that that was my most difficult coaching moment in my career, was well, trying to develop you as a corner. If, if I could be uh, truthful here, you failed. Uh, <laughs> Paul, can you uh, tell the folks who don't remember it about the time Nick Saban tried to develop you as a corner? We were in the front yard on a local TV show, and Saban was the quarterback, and I was defending somebody. And I had, the, I had a beat on the interception, except I used the wrong hand. And, Greeny, I'm not blaming the coach, but I'm blaming the coach. He never told me which hand to use. <laughs> so what you're suggesting is that with a little better coaching, you think uh, that, that, that you and Darrell Revis may someday have been mentioned in the same breath. <laughs> I think so, but uh, I mean, every time I see him, he brings this up. I mean, this happened in 2007, and it still haunts this man. <laughs> it's, the, it's the one guy, you're the one guy he couldn't get through to. <laughs> you're, the, you're literally the one, Nick Saban, the greatest coach of all time, the one guy he couldn't get through to was Paul Feinbaum. Guys, outstanding. Heather, Paul, thank you. Enjoy it all down there today. We'll have Kaitlyn DeBoer a little bit later on the program and looking forward to that. We have a story for the first time in over 17 years. Alabama football starts the season without the legendary Nick Saban. He retired in January, paving the way for Coach DeBoer, who had just led Washington to the national championship game. One thing not changing the quarterback, Jalen Milrow finished the season strong. 20 passing touchdowns, 10 rushing touchdowns, the only other SEC quarterback to do that won the Heisman, Jaden Daniels. ESPN Bet has their over-under total at nine and a half wins, but there is certainly a lot of pressure filling the large shoes of Nick Saban, and that was a conversation you had with Paul Feinbaum earlier this morning. It is enormous, Greeny, and I know he's coming up here in a few minutes, and I'd rather not have you show this to him, but he better get to the playoffs. It is that simple. He didn't take this job uh, to go eight and four and get a nice Florida bowl trip. Alabama is, ex has, is used to playing in the national championship game. So if Kalen DeBoer doesn't make it to the playoffs this year, it's a bust. That's the mouth of the SEC. It should be pointed out. We confirmed with Paul that in the end he was okay with us playing that for the coach. Kalen DeBoer, we so appreciate you making time for us today on what we know is a very busy day. And look, I don't think it's a mystery that, that, that Paul is speaking for a lot of people. This is a complicated situation that you walk into. So I'd be fascinated. Can, can you explain my pressure comes from inside and it comes from outside. What does it feel like for you as you begin this endeavor? No, I totally get uh, everything that comes around, uh, comes with this program and the expectations. And, you know, that's why you come here, to be a part of that. Uh, there's, 
a lot of people that love to be in, in our shoes, my shoes, um, you know, our players as well. And so, uh, you know, you embrace it and uh, you, you pour into everything that matters as far as getting better each and every day. And, uh, you know, you live with the results. And, uh, you know, that's the way I've lived every moment of my coaching career. Um, and that's the way I'll continue to do it here at Alabama. You know, it's the first time I've had a chance to, to chat with you since you took this job. I know you've obviously done a great many interviews since, but I'd be curious to hear, how did you weigh that as you were considering this? I mean, Alabama is a job that almost every college football coach would dream of, but this particular circumstance, following this particular coach, how did you weigh that in as you were making the decision to take this job? Yeah, it, it had to be a special place that was going to pull me from the opportunity that I had there at Washington. But, uh, you know, Alabama, um, that's, that is special. Uh, this place uh, is different. And, uh, you know, following, the sh following uh, Coach Saban, uh, everything that he's done for this program, um, just felt like it was the, the right time, the right opportunity. And uh, it's been an awesome six months here, just uh, getting to know these guys, bringing this staff together. Uh, love the direction we're headed. Uh, great challenges ahead, and I'm looking forward to it. So, so one of those challenges I would have to imagine, if I, I try to put myself in your shoes, would be figuring out how to put my own stamp, in your case, your own stamp on a program that has so much tradition and has had so much success. What is the most important part of doing that? Yeah, you, you have to be you. And, um, you know, uh, taking in all the things that uh, uh, alumni and uh, the great coaches that have gone before me here uh, have done for this program, um, understanding those traditions that uh, the community has, uh, the, the fan base have, uh, even within the, the walls of our program. Um, you know, you embrace all of that, but uh, you have to do it your way. You have to be you. Uh, learn that over many years uh, and, uh, you know, have a good feel and, of what I want that to look like. And so uh, I'm fortunate to have a staff that has a, a similar philosophy as mine, and uh, we're looking to, you know, just take it one day at a time and grow our team together. Well, Nick will still be around. He'll obviously be doing commentary and all that sort of thing. And I know you and he have developed a good relationship. But what would you say is the single best piece of advice he's given to you as you begin this undertaking? Oh, I don't know if there's one single piece. I think anytime you're with Coach Saban, um, you're just trying to grasp onto everything uh, he has to share. And uh, it might not even be something specific. It just might be the way he carries himself and the way he uh, just kind of views things. And so, um, you know, I've watched from afar for many years. Uh, I've even had to process a little bit of what are the things that I already do that maybe uh, I've taken from things I've heard from him or seen mm. from him and his teams um, in the past year, two, five, ten years, you know. And so, um, you know, I think as much as, uh, you know, we have maybe um, different ways of, of coaching, I think there's still probably more similarities than probably even most people would understand. Well, let me talk about something that all college football coaches are dealing with now, and that is the completely new world in which you are operating. We go from a system in which four teams make the football, college football playoff. Yours, of course, was one of them a year ago in Washington, to one where now 12 teams will make it. There's been some discussion about unintended consequences of that, different ways of approaching it. How do you view your approach uh, being different this coming season based on the new format? Yeah, I think as far as getting the playoff, you still have to take the same approach in that, you know, there's no wiggle room. Every game matters. Um, you know, uh, the key is, though, that you play your best football at the end of the season. And uh, you got to start strong and, and get that momentum early on. Uh, you got to get into the playoff, but be playing your best football, be the health, as healthy as you possibly can, and then uh, make that playoff run. And I've uh, been a part of that many years, uh, being a small college guy. It's a special time. Uh, I've really. Uh, enjoyed that. Uh, it's a, a win or go home type of mentality. Um, it, it's fun to be a part of, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, I, I know you college football coaches, you plan literally everything, so I have no doubt you've already given some thought to this. We played a soundbite from Dabo Sweeney earlier this morning saying that, well, one of those unintended consequences might be you're 11-0 and at the end of the season, and maybe like they do in the NFL, you're resting players because you know you're already going to make it. That's going to be a decision that a college football coach is going to have to make that has never happened in the 100-plus year history of the sport. Have you given thought to how you would handle a situation like that? Yeah, I think there's, uh, there are situations like that, that, uh, you know, when you're talking around the staff room, um, you know, uh, guys uh, kind of throw out there and, 
You know, I think you just got to play it as it comes. Um, you know, the hypotheticals and all that, you can get caught up in it, but uh, it is what it is. Um, the setup is, is there for us, and, um, you know, what we're going to focus on is uh, August, and then we're going to focus on week one, and at some point we'll get to that point, hopefully, where we have to make uh, some decisions like that. But um, as far as us uh, here at Alabama, I know our goal will be to, to win that game. Uh, Give something fun.